Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and we have a huge day on the podcast. We have the one and only Lee Harris. If you haven't heard of Lee Harris, I'm so excited for you because uh, there's so much cool stuff that you can learn. Uh, Lee Harris is, I, how do you put it, an energy worker. Uh, his, he is the author of Conversation with Z's, book one, and Energy Speaks, a gifted energy intuitive and channeler. He leads a vibrant online community that reaches hundreds of thousands of people every month. He's also an amazing musician and has made some incredible music and has an awesome YouTube channel and gives energy updates on a regular basis. And there's and that's just a, a small sliver of, of Lee Harris. And I was fortunate enough to get a chance to talk to him. So he agreed to come on. Welcome to the Reality Revolution, Lee. Hi, thank you so much for having me. No, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. So for let's just give an idea for people that may not have heard of you, and, and that might be a very small number, but the number of people that uh, uh, maybe that haven't heard of you uh, about your journey, about how you came to this point, and uh, what inspired you to become an author and, and do the things you do. Well, I think probably like many of us, um, my passion was self growth, personal development, metaphysics, and it became my main passion with the exception of making music, I should add, uh, from the age of about 16, 17. And I went to all kinds of workshops, I read all the books, I was taking myself off to all kinds of healings. Um, I had met a channeler, I was a little skeptical of his channeling, not the information, because his information was brilliant, but it wasn't that I was attracted to channeling. And I think in my head, I remember coming away from it and thinking, well, that was really good, but why did he have to close his eyes and put on a strange voice in order to give me that information? Because I, I just didn't get it. Um, mm -hmm. And then about a year later, it, it, it happened to me, um, which is the most surprising thing for me about uh, meeting my guides is almost where I met them. I was on the subway, the London Underground, going to work and sifting through all the negative thoughts in my head. I was very good at negative self-talk in my early 20s. And um, yeah, they basically interrupted me, told me my thoughts were wrong, told me why. And after a few days, when I realized it wasn't multiple personality disorder, although if it was multiple personality disorder, it was the most useful personality <laughs> I had inside my head, that, that I was clear about. So I just realized what was going on. And, and um, so, yeah, I was a very private channeler for myself for several years. And then there were a few close friends who were open to this kind of stuff who I would just give readings and information to. And then after several years, a friend who was a yoga teacher encouraged me to do private readings for people because I was doing them for people at coffee. And she said, why don't you formalize this and do this for people who you don't know? I was very nervous. I didn't think anyone would come, but it, they did. Like immediately, as soon as she sent me out in her newsletter and word of mouth spread, um, I did 60 readings in the first 60 days, which blew my mind. And from there, I did readings for 15 years uh, until 2019. And along the way, started doing recordings. And it just kept growing the ways that I would offer the work of the channeling, but also being an intuitive guide for people and helping people process and understand their experiences around this stuff. Because that was always a missing piece for me. I always felt like I have these big profound experiences, but I don't always know how to process them, how they interact with my human life. So that, that's that been a passion of mine all these years. So in the book, you mentioned that Z is from the ninth dimension. And I'm fascinated by that and fascinated by they have a particular description of the dimensions. What is your impression of what the ninth dimension is? What dimension are we in and how are we and how are we moving through dimensions? Well, it's interesting. I personally have always had a bit of a resistance to the dimension labels just right. because I think we can we can get confused. We can get fixed. You know, I've, I've seen it uh, be unhelpful to people as much as I've seen it be helpful. What they've explained is that dimensions rather than uh, heights, you know, we tend to think, oh, the ninth dimension must be 
20 feet above our head, they say, no, dimensions of reality exist on the ground every day. When you're dealing with what they call higher dimensions, even though it doesn't necessarily relate to height, they say octaves of love, harmony, presence, connectedness will be involved. So when you get to the ninth dimension and beyond, apparently those are just more prevalent. So they say we can go from the third to the ninth dimension within an hour. We can have a tough 3D experience, which often refers to things that are a bit more to do with fear or control or resistance, like heavier emotional energies, heavier thought patterns, things that trap us inside ourselves. They say you can be going through that for 20 minutes and then all of a sudden someone with a big open heart comes along and because you connect with them for 10 minutes, your energy shifts and the dimension shifts. So that's how they explain it. They say we're moving through different dimensions all of the time. Some people are very good at connecting to higher or wider dimensions and, and others don't. It, it, we're all supposed to be in slightly different places at slightly different times, depending on what we need uh, and what we're going through in our life and, and how we're contributing to the collective that day. Now, the unique thing about you is that you're an amazing musician. You even had number one songs on iTunes. Yeah. And so, uh, um, and, and you discussed this a little bit. There is a, a link from music to your connection with disease. I'm a huge music fan, and I right. definitely feel a shift in my consciousness every time. In fact, it's, it's, it's an automatic way for me to immediately shift my consciousness and program myself is I can listen to that old song and, and, it, and boom, you know, whatever. It, I, for me, it's the easiest. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to tell me about your story and, and, and how they related to that. I'm exactly the same as you. I think many of us are. You know, music to me is the ultimate spiritual language yes. because it doesn't matter what your beliefs are. And it, it's not really about mental concepts. It's, it's something that moves into our body and moves through us and rearranges us. I mean, it's incredible. It's experiential. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, music was one of my saving graces. When I was a teen, like I think many teens, music became a refuge and it became a place I could go when I was struggling. Um, so I was a big, big, big music fan and I sang since I was a kid, you know, in musicals and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the age of 21, and this was uh, about 18 months before I met the Z's, I heard music like, and I'd never had that experience before. It was like hearing songs above my head. And often the lyrics would be there too, but always the melodies and the melodies would be fully formed. And so I started to write and I started to write on guitar. And that was like a lightning bolt change in my life. That was like a moment when I was like, oh my God, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and uh, they've since told me that um, that was their first way of reaching me, that the channel opened up first through music. And then a year and a half later, verbal contact was allowed to be established. Now, this is something I found out years later, sure. um, but it kind of makes sense because of the power of that experience. So now myself and Devor Bozik, who is my main collaborator for all of our music, um, you know, we love producing music that's tuned to 528 hertz, which is a healing frequency. But we also have really been, I would say over the last few years, playing with creating songs that have conscious lyrics and consciousness within them so that the people who like them can use the music in a very conscious expansive way totally unrelated to the podcast but as a music fan explain to me why why the guitar is going away i miss the i miss the the guitar solos you know you know in the, in, in the old days you'd hear that great 20 30 second guitar solo nowadays you'll hear guitar and it, it'll just like be with rhythm guitar. And, and there's almost a fear of really going back to that. Um, it, it's, the, it's the greatest instrument in the world to me. And I just wanted to know your opinion on it, unrelated to anything spiritual. <laughs> well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I love guitar, but for me, it's piano. So it's piano. There's, there's something about an instrument that resonates with each of us for whatever reason. It's like, you know, I've got my friends who love heavy metal. I've got my friends who only listen to classical. Music's a very personal thing because whatever we're attracted to, it either completes or balances something in us. So if, I, I think what you're saying about with 
the guitar, I mean, music seems to just go through trends, right. certainly when you look at popular music. So if you look at pop music or what, what's hitting the mainstream, um, you know, we just go through phases and trends. I'm sure the guitar will come back in a bigger way. But, you know, some of my favorite, I, was it John Williams's classical guitar? I'm yeah. trying to, I, th I loved that album. I, I listened to it so much in my 20s. In fact, that, that makes me want to go and listen to it again. So yeah. the good news is there's so many people making music now, you can always find what you need. But yeah, I there's certain music that's coming out today in the mainstream that I like. Um, and a lot of it to me is a little too buried in computer. But that doesn't mean it's not great for the people who are vibing with it. It's just I, I like something a little more organic. However, that said, there are some amazing uh, computer based uh, pieces coming out that manage to keep the human soul as well as the machine. For me, if it sounds too much like a machine, I'm not very interested. I need something to grab me on a soul level. Now, your music, um, it, it, another thing that relates with your music, and I wanted to know if there was an influence. Um, is the space between notes um mm. this becomes important i can I, I can tell that that's almost a note in itself the space between notes the, that that silence between and i wanted to get your opinion about that well it, you know and and this is where it would be great to talk to devore because he's our lead arranger with everything right, right. that we do but I, I it's interesting the space between notes i think well there's a couple of things music is rearranging you so when we listen to music it is fusing and changing and influencing us i think we're often taught to think of it as entertainment but it's way more than that like mm -hmm. like we were just saying you know i i put david pramal and maten on in the car today they are one of my go-to's because i love those guys i love their frequency and I, i'm like i just want to bathe in some of that frequency but it has an effect on me when I listen to it. So I always think that the space is the moment when we can feel ourselves and breathe. But I, I will say the one thing that Devor and I spend a lot of time on is mixing our tracks. So for those who don't make music, you know, you can have a guitar, a piano, a drum, three different vocal tracks, and perhaps some synthesizers. The way you blend those is everything. So it might sound like, well, everything's recorded. Now let's just put the song out. You know, the, taking one instrument down a decibel here and there does massive things to the way that people hear the sound. So one of the things I spend a lot of time on with our music is listening, 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 and adjusting, adjusting, adjusting to kind of get the blend right so that it hits the body and the consciousness in the way that feels important. Amazing. So one thing that you talk about, and I wanted to get your uh, opinion on is the importance of laughter, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and how laughter can change you and modify very much like music. Um, and, 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 and maybe perhaps what disease have told you about that. Let's reflect uh, what you think about laughter. Yeah, there's a whole piece in the book where they talk about how much of a release laughter is and how powerful it is. They say, you know, we're often focused on crying. You know, we're often taught to focus on, oh, crying is cathartic and it is a release. And of course that is true, but they say we, we forget about laughter and how powerful that is. And I've always felt that stand-up comedians are healers who are moving a room. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you will resonate with every stand-up comedian, but it also doesn't mean you'll resonate with every healer. You know, you might have to go to four different therapists or shamanic instructors to find the one that's the right fit for you. So when you have a stand-up comedian moving a room like that and making them laugh at things that they are thinking, I mean, the classic, isn't it, is when, is when a stand-up comedian gives voice to a, a fear or a thought that we all have and we all go, oh, we start laughing because it, right. it opens up that thing that we're holding on to tightly. So it's very powerful. And um, yeah, the Zs have a good sense of humor. And um, thank God, because I grew up in a family where humor, I think, was one of the release valves for us as a group. And, mm -hmm. and, and I actually um, I had a period in my, I would say late twenties, early thirties, especially working in spirituality and self growth, it can sometimes be a bit humorless. Mm -hmm. And so I think I got used to that because I was doing so much work with so many people. And, and then in my early thirties, I kind of had this breakthrough moment where just in my own work, I knew I wanted to um, bring humor in to 
alleviate things and to, you know, even now, you know how it how it is and anybody listening, you can be in a fairly tense conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. And sure, you probably don't want to do this if they're ready for a fight, because it might not go very well. But if there's a tension in the room, or if there's an unease, if you can bring a laugh into that room, it just diffuses everything. So the Z's really just explain why energetically laughter is so powerful for us and how it moves us into our hearts again. And so um, I really loved that part of the book and the conversation because I should add the book began as conversations. So the audible version of the book is the original conversations where Diana Edwards, psychotherapist, is interviewing me while I'm channeling the Z's. So on the audible version, you actually hear the conversations as they were happening in real time. Now, one of the big revelations and, and the thing that that disease really teach well, and as we can see on your YouTube channel, is energy mm -hmm. uh, and how it works, how it's changing, how we're evolving with this energy. Um, it's really helped me to un understand energies and, and, and my adaptation to it. How do you define energy to begin with? What, you know, how do you define it um, as as it's related and, and, and its importance in in our spiritual path? It's funny because, you know, people have often asked me, especially if they, you know, if they see my email address or something, they go, oh, you work in gas, oil, electricity. <laughs> I'm like, uh, of a human kind. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, for me, the energy, it incorporates everything. It incorporates our chi or our life force, you know, the energy that moves through us and animates us, our soul energy. But I also relate it to our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings. Uh, what we're moving through. So for me, energy defines anything that includes your state of being. So for example, if you're not very well, if you're sick, the Z's will often say it's hard to really access your full energy when you're struggling with a physical illness. And so you, you're in a different energy state. The reason I started doing what are called my energy updates, which is a monthly video that I put out for free at the beginning of each month, and they're usually 30 minutes long. I get seven, eight headlines from the Z's about things that will be showing up for us as a collective in the month to come. And of course, it's only for people who resonate with me, my work, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's not going to be for every single person on the planet. But for anyone who's curious, for me, I know that whenever I'm going through things, it really helps me if I either have the space within myself to be able to just let it move through me and or a greater understanding of it. Sometimes you don't know what's going on and that's fine. Sometimes you can just surrender it and go, I have no idea what's going on this week. But as a person who was always very strong in feeling and sensitive, I always loved seeing people who would help me have a framework for that. So that was why I started doing the energy updates. I wanted to, not from the Z's perspective, but from a human perspective, give language to, okay, what does it look like if sheets of emotion are coming off us this month? And why is that happening? Oh, it's happening because the consciousness is raising and a lot of people are feeling overwhelmed and disoriented and that affects all of us. It's a ripple effect. So I think one of the things I hope I managed to convey within the energy updates is we're all going through it together, even if it doesn't look exactly the same for you as it does for me that week. And we're all having a massive effect on each other as we go through it together. So um, that's really why I started doing the energy updates. So when I'm in that mode, I consider myself as an energy intuitive. I am tapping into the Z's, but I'm giving language to it on a human grounded level in the hope that it can be of use to people and their process. One of the things I was inspired to start my podcast and the reason I, you know, talk to people like you uh, is I, I feel like there is a shift in energy globally that is happening, um, that has been happening. Um, and I think that you're tuned into that. You're kind of talking about almost like a Walter Cronkite of the energy change, right? Like, like narrating what's going on for all of us. Do you think we're experiencing uh, a shift, a discernible shift in energy and what is happening to the world? Just if we were to start with that. 
I definitely do. And I, I know that many of us do. Of course, there will be people on the planet who will go, what are you talking about? Because it's not their alignment. It's not their area. It's not their sensitivity, perhaps. But yeah, I, I it's funny you say uh, about the, because um, I've, I've often thought, in a way, the job I do and that other people do is like being a bit of a weatherman for energy right. or a weather woman, you know. Um, what I've noticed, because I'm I'm really quite shocked at where we're at in some ways. I remember back in like 2004, 2005, the Z's would say things like, after 2012, you're going to see a big rise in people's interest in healing and emotional awareness and metaphysics. And at the time, I remember thinking, oh, that sounds nice, but seems unlikely. Mm -hmm. or, or it seemed unlikely in the way that they were telling me. And this is, you know, 16 years ago, 17 years ago. But now I'm like, oh, I see, <laughs> you know, it's everywhere. And thank God. And whether it's that someone's interested in nutrition and fitness, whether it's that someone's interested in letting go of trauma, you know, there's all different ways to heal and experience yourself. It's extraordinary how much is out there now. And I think the only reason it's there is because we are rising in consciousness and it's confusing. And especially because the world we live in does not represent higher consciousness at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. You're in this weird place of, wow, this system and the way that the person at the head of that system just spoke to everybody is really, really not good. It's like from the 1950s and you know, it's like, what's going on. And yet at the same time, on the street and in conversations happening on the internet or in real life, really interesting things are being spoken about and innovation is coming through from people who are pioneers in their area that we could never have imagined. So I do definitely uh, experience and witness this rise in consciousness, but I also acknowledge what the Z's say, which is they say we're in the middle of an energetic war. And they say that not to scare us or to depress us. It, it, it kind of helps me make sense of things when I see that push pull energy going on on the planet. You know, someone comes up with this brilliant solution and you're like, wow, that's great. And then it gets squashed or it gets banned. And you're like, hang on a second. So there is this kind of dance that we're in that can be very um, uncomfortable, disheartening, um, infuriating, depending on who you are and depending on what day. But but they've always said that when consciousness really rises, it will be messy for a while because it will take time for the world to catch up. Um, and when they say time, they mean it could be decades. So they always forecast 2020 to 2030 would be like a massive change decade. And I think we can all agree that 2020 kicked that off with a bang. So what I discern in, in when people talk about energy, they think, oh, uh, I got more energy. It's like a cup of coffee. I have more energy. And, and we're, energy is different than just energy that, you know, makes you alert. Uh, it, it feels like the light particles that make up all the matter around us, there's this other potential light particle that is available to me, that is more complex, that carries more information. And um, that's the kind of energy I, 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 I'd like, love to discern um, in particular is is there some sort of is, is it related to the light and the matter that makes up our universe that we're in well it's interesting because you know a couple of things i'm just gonna i'm gonna back up a little bit in your in your question because for example like if 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 i'm very you talked about energy and animation and like if i'm very excited you know i've kind of got all this energy coming out of me there's going to be a way i'm producing and rippling into a room and if i'm very depressed and really struggling in myself i'm going to be a bit more like this and a bit more inward and a bit more down and a bit more unavailable for connection so what's going on inside us with our own energy balance has a really massive effect on what happens next in our life. If I'm shut down and depressed and I can't get out my own way, I'm gonna miss all the potential opportunities that could have pulled me out. Not judging that because there are times where we are depressed or there are times where we are going through heavy periods. But equally, if I can't change my energy from only being excited all the time, if I'm always at that pitch, I'm gonna miss so many subtleties. So for me, energy mastery 
is being able to carve out the space inside yourself that you need. So for example, one of the great joys for me in the last like six years has been peace. Uh, the joy that comes with peace. Now in my twenties, of course, I was all about euphoria and, oh, it's great when you have massive expansions. So as we go through our life, our connection to light, to our consciousness changes. But in, in relation to what you just said, one thing that comes to me to share, the Z's say that an enormous amount of our energy influence comes from within the earth. They say we're often looking outside our bodies and kind of looking up and looking around. And they say a huge amount of energy is coming from the inner earth. And that is where the rise in consciousness is coming from. They've talked about a couple of different things. They've talked about crystalline energy. They've talked about crystalline pyramids that they have said are in the earth. And these things are activating in a way that is almost uh, detoxing us as a planet from from the bottom up, which is also why so much base chakra fighting energy has been going on, mm -hmm. because a lot of people can't handle it, they can't transmute it, they don't want to let go of what they're holding on to. So I can't necessarily speak scientifically to the things that you just spoke about with light and particles, because I'm not a scientist. But from an energetic perspective, at least from my guys, that's what they talk about. And they say that um, what's actually happening to us is we are becoming the new human soul that we were always designed to be, but that approximately 10,000 or so years ago, we got clamped. They basically said our, our evolution was interfered with and we were clamped. And what's happening now is the clamp is coming off. This is a time in Earth's history where the evolution has to happen. Uh, we can no longer be held down. Otherwise, we don't survive. And they haven't said we won't survive, quite the opposite. They've said even though you might worry about certain things or be told by certain groups, X, Y, or Z is going to happen. This is the plan. You've got no power in it. They say that's not the truth. So that was a, a lot, but I, I hope no. that some of that related to your question. And one of the things I, I love about disease, I, you know, when I evaluate, you know, the million channelers in the world, right? And, right. and, 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 and even as a channeler, you, you, you may access something. Is this disease? I mean, um, but I can tell that their message resonates with me because it's not fear based. They avoid bringing anything that's fear based or dooming us to some apocalypse or warning us about some particular date. It's always coming from a loving perspective. And that tells me that uh, th that resonates with me. Yeah, and I love that you say that because I, one, one of the things I appreciate about them, because there's no way I would be channeling them if, uh, if, I, if I wasn't okay with the frequency that I see them emit and the effect mm -hmm. I see them have. But one of the things they're very good at, and I learn through this too, they'll be in the middle of channeling some message and they will literally say, and for those of you who just went into fear because of that sentence, you misinterpreted what we said. But notice that. Notice that you just interpreted what we said in a fear-based doom and gloom way. Wow. Notice how much your world is encouraging you to do that, that that was where your mind went. This is what we were actually saying. So they do this kind of energy tweaking as they're giving messages, which I find very interesting. And it's also mm -hmm. helped me not only with my own, of course, my own personal stuff around that, but it's helped me when I'm interacting with people see things in a wider way. I mean, they completely uh, help me zoom out. And I, I know my capacity to zoom out would not be what it was if I had not been, you know, working with and listening to them for 23 years. One of the episodes that I, I, I loved of yours, and, and I'd like to talk about it further, because um, I think it's sort of what the disease are helping with. It's easy to look out at the world and just be overwhelmed globally. Like we have wars, we have famines, we have global warming. And, you know, on a spiritual level, it becomes a disease because people lose hope, what, what, what is my reason for meditating? Why do I need to help my kids out? The world's coming to an end. Everybody's telling me it's all over, right? Um, how, and, and you discuss how to cope with this global overwhelm and, 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 and we can overcome it. And, and there's ways that we have some level of control. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, usually, and I know this is true for me, we become overwhelmed. Yes. So we basically become 
the energy of overwhelm. And I think in that episode you're talking about, and, and this comes up a lot in my work, what part of us can sit back, step back, turn off the phone, turn off the TV, uh, take a one hour break from being available to the people in our life. I know that can be challenging if you have kids or, you know, I, I, I understand that's not true, that true for everybody all the time. But if you find yourself spinning out and off balance, do you think that it's normal to just carry on? Or have you trained yourself to recognize, oh, hang on a second, this is that moment where I'm going to drop things. This is that moment where I might have a car accident. This is that moment where I'm going to make really poor choices for myself because my nervous system is so overstimulated, I can't regulate. So as an empath and a sensitive person, like I'm sure many of your people are, you know, regulating my nervous system is, is a, is a, full-time and constant job in that it changes all the time. Um, but one of the things the Z's have said is they say the brilliance of the internet is that it connected us all and it gave us all essentially a kind of psychic information highway to work with that we previously didn't have on a worldwide level. The downside, they say, of the internet is we're toddlers when it comes to the internet. And we don't know that we should stop eating the M&Ms after we've eaten nine bags of them because we're going to go into a sugar rush that's going to throw us all over the room. So, you know, usually toddlers have parents kind of hopefully supervising them and guiding them. And yet here we are with this overwhelming, overstimulating internet that we have. And so you have to also learn, oh, okay, today... I cannot tune in on what's going in on in those three countries that I am in this moment powerless to do anything about. It's actually not good for me to know X, Y, Z. The other big issue that we have is, you know, if you look at our fear based um, media, and again, there's some fantastic journalists, there's some fantastic uh, media outlets, but the main overarching theme in our media there isn't celebration or uh, evidences of evolution. And if there are, they're very scientific usually and very data-based. They aren't usually feeling-based. They aren't usually... So, so the nervous system's left out of it unless it's given stories and information that makes you go, oh my God, oh my God. You know, so it's kind of like it gets us into this cycle of expecting that to be the norm. So one of the things that has really hit me between the eyes in recent years is about five years ago, uh, they said self care is not a luxury. They said many of you think of it as a thing to kind of look after yourself or reset yourself. But they said at this point in time, at this point in history, self care has to be a priority. And for many of us, self care will be having the wherewithal to go, oh, I'm really overstimulated right now. So I should do something about that rather than just push through and whether it's meditate, whether it's just sit quietly with your eyes closed for 10 minutes, whether it's put on soothing music to try and help your nervous system calm down, whether it's supplementation, whatever it is, um, doing something about it because our nervous systems are going to be challenged as we go through a time like this and learning to work with and regulate them and heal them as much as we can is really key, not just for our well-being now, but for us as a society going forward. What did, what have the Z's talk to you about the real, the um, parallel realities and shifts in dimension where people experience the Mandela effects and and have memories from other alternate realities? Have they expounded on this particular phenomenon that's going on as we shift? You know, that that's something I have heard about, um, but not so much from them. So I, I would I would say to anyone interested in that, there are probably other sources or teachers or voices out there who really focus on that. But what the, what they do seem to do, which I like, they say that our past lives, other lives, timelines are as important to us as this present moment. So they're not and, and I've had like past life recall experiences, you know, and there was a period in my life where I found that fascinating and it was a big deal for me, but they've kind of got me to this place where it's, it's like it, there is no time. 
Everything is a spiral, not a linear line. So they say you're spiraling your way through time. You're spiraling your way through your evolution. You're spiraling your way through your life. There might be past life events or experiences that move through you at certain moments that line up karmically with what you're going through now. But the thing they've also said is you can pick up on other people's past life events. You might walk down a street and think, oh my God, I think I lived here and I was a medieval warrior. And they said, maybe, or maybe you just connected with the entity, the energy or the memory trail that's still there energetically and you psychically opened to it. So they tend to take a slightly more now focused view but again, there are probably brilliant uh, teachers, teachings out there on those things. But the Zs are most interested in how does it relate to our current expansion? And they're always bringing it back to, to that. Totally ironic because I, I was doing an episode in some research yesterday talking about that spiral instead of the linear time. And the argument was made, I think, you know, Gurdjieff and Uspensky were saying that it's not really a reincarnation that in, in some cases we're going back in time and reliving our life over and over. And so we're have, you know, we, we, maybe we did something differently, um, but we're spiraling. Maybe we're learning as we go, as we ascend, but it's not necessarily a linear. Uh, I die and move on to the next life. I die and move on to the next life. I don't have they discussed going, you know, the past in that manner or the nature of time? They have talked about past lives that we would understand as past, but they do say time is not linear. Right. They say we think time is linear, but they also say we think everything is linear. Like I think back to, um, again, I'll go back to my 20s when I would say some 20s and early 30s, I had some major past life experiences and, and, and awakenings because of them. And at the time, the way I framed them was, oh my God, this was my 15th century life. This was my, and that was important to me. I needed to organize it that way. If it happened to me now, I would be like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> this is right. just moving through. But that's that's partly my evolution because I've had many years now to, I guess, deepen with this understanding that everything is concurrent. If, if you're reliving a past life, you're actually in the present. So it's important to remember that side of it. That's what the Zs would say. They'd say, yeah, this is a past life memory, but you're experiencing it through the lens of your present consciousness, which means it isn't the past. So I, I don't mean that to sound too head trippy, but that's how they explain it. So a popular concept obviously talked about and you talk about in in spiritual work is is the shadow and as we have more light coming into the world there's you know a greater shadow um how do we cope and deal with this shadow what have disease taught you about this unique aspect of our consciousness well my perspective of the shadow was as someone coming up through you know and i'm 46 so i really started my journey with all of this about 30 years ago um, at that time, there were two camps. There was avoid the shadow and uh, only focus on the good and everything's love and light. Or there were the people who dove headlong into shadow work. Um, what I'm seeing is that we're more willing to look at all sides of ourselves. We're no longer taught or asked to be ashamed of who we are and to suppress and deny. So I think a, a lot of movement has been made around the shadow if you like, but again, we have to be careful not to make it too polarizing. The Z's will say, you're all everything. And they always say that anything that is within us, we over-personalize. So for example, let's say you have a shadow of being a jealous person and you know it's a shadow and you're working on it and you're kicking yourself and blaming yourself. They say it didn't come from you. They say it's, it's what you did with the collective dis-ease of jealousy and scarcity. It's how you interpreted it. It's how your life circumstances made you wear it as an outfit. So they're, they're basically reminding that as we heal parts of ourselves, we also heal that for the collective. And that's really what we're doing here. We're incarnating at a certain point in planetary history into an energy template of humanity that we then take on our own outfit within and so the shadow pieces are things that the Z's will say, celebrate yourself if you notice something like that. Don't beat yourself up because that's the same cycle. 
They say, if you notice, oh, that was quite selfish and unloving of me, they say, great, that's a moment of awareness that you can now shift. And just your awareness of wanting to elevate the way you behave is huge. The word that you were using is collective, and, and it is a common theme with channelers that I respect. Um, is that part of the shift that we're going through energetically and on le many levels uh, is we're moving beyond an individualized consciousness where when I'm talking to you, I, I, I'm relating to you as if you're myself. I, can, I, I, I have your memories and feelings and we're vibrating on the same level as if we are the same person. And, and, and as I go out to the grocery store, um, I'm having revelations, you know, I'm not just em empathetic, you know, I'm just a normal em empath, not compared to my friends that are super empathic, but I can feel, I can feel their depressions, I have greater awareness of what's going on. When I'm watching TV and somebody uh, is being beaten to death, I am feeling every single lash and, 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 and it's not just me, there is something happening that on a larger scale, a collective almost being is being formed. Uh, that we're just a part of. And I wanted to know if the Zs have discussed this and your perspective of it. So the Zs would describe that as, they would go, they would call that higher consciousness because if you think about just the meaning of consciousness itself, it's how aware are we? Uh, how aware are we of ourselves and everything going on around us and how can we connect to it? So what you're talking about is a no division consciousness. And I would argue, I think you are a super empath. Your empathy might not look like your friends because remember, there is no one such thing as an empath. There are right. loads of different kinds of empaths and there are empaths who deal with their empathy in a very skilled way and they've figured out how to use it as a gift. There are those who still see it as a curse or experience it as a curse and they haven't yet figured out how to you know, own, own their boundary and all of that kind of stuff, all of the kind of stuff you have to do to kind of get back in your body. But the gift of what you're describing is I can feel for my fellow brother, sister, person, soul, and I can feel it as if it's happening to me. So the Zs will say that is collective consciousness, that is building bridges between ourselves and reconnecting, because they say that one of the biggest numbers that was done on us was we were taught to disconnect from each other, and we've been encouraged to disconnect from each other. And in disconnection from each other, in division, if we are divided, we fall because our, our group intelligence and our group heart is really important. We may not have been trained to understand that, but that is just the truth of who we are. So when you describe that more people like yourself, like yourself and like others are coming into that, that to me is just indicative of everything we've been talking about. You know, this rise in feeling, empathy, compassion, heart, what the Zs would call oneness. And they say that the highest octave in the universe is oneness. And whenever you're in oneness, the heart is always involved. And the heart can be something that we act upon. The heart can be something that we, you know, help out our friend with action. You might be the kind of person who has lots of heart loving words. We're all different in the way that we show up with our heart. And we should be. So I love that you even started, you know, that talking point that we're on by talking about how different we all are, and yet we are the same. And the Z's say you're supposed to be different because you're each playing a part in this moment in history. And your uniqueness it doesn't doesn't separate you from others. It should be the jigsaw piece that can click you into connection with others. So they say, get behind your uniqueness. So long as you always remember that you're part of a collective, the person who thinks they're more important than everyone else is, you know, that's a sad way to be. And it's usually coming from wounding. Um, and likewise, the person who feels that they are less important than everyone else is equally disconnecting themselves from the energy of connection that we're all supposed to have at some level. Now, as empathy increases, uh, what, what, one thing that people struggle with is, first of all, they, they don't know if this feeling they're having is their own. 
And, you know, as they become aware of their empathy, they, you know, they, they, they can't go to the movie theater. They can't, you know, they can't go to a large party because they're bringing in all the feelings of everyone. And, and I know people that become sort of like hermits because they're, they're afraid to be exposed to all those other feelings. Obviously you've had to deal with this. Do you have ways of, of maneuvering through this increase in empathy um, and, and working with others when that happens? Well, firstly, you know, going to the movie theater in a party, I think basically our movies and our parties need to evolve. That's basically what needs to happen, you know, a different kind of party to the ones that we and you know that they exist. And you know, many of us have been to them. Um, but I think in mass consciousness, there's still this idea of what a party is. And so for me with movies, um, you know, I like I like fantasy and I like sci fi, but I definitely hook out when they put that 20 minute battle at the end, then I'm like, okay, I've seen this a million times, and this is going to bring the vibration right down. So I have got quite attuned to how those kinds of things affect me. But before I had got attuned to that and made choices as to whether or not I was going to expose myself to that on that day, um, I would be affected by them. So I think every empath goes through those periods you're talking about. I will still have moments in my life where I'm like, oh, no, I'm too raw right now, or I'm too open. I am not going to the mall. I am not going out into the world. So I still make choices based on how I'm doing. But I did go through very big periods of my life, especially when I was having op openings where I just couldn't watch television. I couldn't go, go out. So you go through those periods, but you have to understand that as you're going through those periods, you're learning how to develop a second skin or you're learning to break up with some of those things you used to do that you used to see as normal that have actually been eroding you. So I think it's personal for everybody, depending on what you need, who you are, what stage of evolution you're at with your empathy. But I, I also think, and this is the truth of empathy, as our empathy increases, we're going to improve things. You know, I, I'll, I'll just look at, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm married to an African American and I have had a very white experience in my life. I mean, I always had friends of color, but I really feel like in the last few years, and obviously for me in my marriage, uh, that kind of shifted my perspective of what it's like, especially to be a, a black person in America, because that's the experience I get to see the most. Um, it, it shifted my empathy. And then of course, again, I feel like in the last two, three years, those of us who perhaps weren't that aware of what people of color have had to deal with that we as white people don't have to deal with. And of course, people get all up in arms and they go, oh, it's all a scam and white lives matter too. Of course, white lives matter. Every life matters. But what we're doing is we're trying to rebalance a group who have been persecuted and subjugated. And look at that. That's all we're doing. It doesn't shouldn't threaten your existence. And if it does, you really need to look at yourself. So basically, I think that's just one example. You know, the Me Too movement's another. There are lots of different areas of life where we are trying to sometimes not very well, sometimes mm -hmm. not very elegantly, sometimes too reactively or too heavy handedly. We're trying to rebalance certain areas where we are experiencing inequality. And I mean, you only have to scan the world to see inequality everywhere in, in so many systems and so many ways. And of course, you know, you can, it doesn't matter about the color of your skin. There are so many ways you can be harmed by the system or uh, unequal to others. So that's why I think it's going to be a long journey. I think as, as we as a society continue to evolve, we as a group consciousness will continue to improve and ask for changes. And, and I think, you know, that's a long game. The Z's say that we're here for uh, our lifetime, our human lifetime in this incarnation. But they say that the work we're here to do is really, really important. Doesn't mean you'll get to see the end results of what you're working on now, but that's not the point. You're still contributing to society and humanity while you're here. And that's why they say we come here. Do the Z's talk about the power of thoughts creating reality, the power of imagination? Do they guide you or tell you about that process of our thoughts outpicturing themselves in the world? 
Well, I mean, I'm trying to think, have they ever overly specified on that in a way? I mean, perhaps they haven't as well, because there are some really good teachers out there already doing that. Like I yeah. know that Esther and Abraham, I discovered Esther Hicks. I'd been channeling for approximately nine years when I first mm -hmm. saw a video of hers. And it was lovely because I was like, oh, that reminds me of the Z's a bit, a certain energy in the frequency. But she's very brilliant at teaching law of attraction and thoughts become things yeah. and then i think of mike dooley who's you know thoughts become things and so they've never overly um spent time on that but what they're really all about and this has been my direct experience with them they can move you beyond a thought by shining a flashlight on how much bigger everything is than any thought you're having mm. that's the experience i've had like they'll tell me why I'm wrong about something. And on a mental level, I'm like, oh gosh, oh yeah, I see that. But more than the mental level, what I go from like this to this, right. because they suddenly just take me beyond that small dimension of mind. So for me, it's less that they uh, spend a lot of time explaining thoughts, um, but more that because they don't uh, exist fully in the realm of thought, Thoughts are included and words are used to help you unpack things. But vibrationally, I feel like you can't really listen to the Z's and only remain in your thoughts because that's just not what they're doing and that's not the transmission of energy. So I hope that explains, uh, I hope that was a, 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 a clear enough answer to no, your, your very good question. Do, um, do they come in any time? Can you be driving and then they just they oh, just yeah, pop they, in or and you um, know it's what unexpected? They do, and it's it it's always annoying to me when they do because um they will I call it donk me over the head. They don't actually hit me over the head, but right. they will donk me over the head with some kind of revelation or sometimes a preparation sentence. Like they've told me you're leaving this, you know, I was living in Boulder, Colorado, and they said, I was out hiking one day and when, when I would often be thinking or occasionally talking to them. And they just came into my head and said, you're leaving Boulder, you're going to California, you need to go to California. You've got about six to nine months prepare. I was heartbroken, you know, I was trying to right. make Boulder work. I was, oh no, you know, and so I went through grief for a few days. And again, it's my choice. I'm not going to do something just because they tell me to, but I've learned they're usually correct and they only ever give me that stuff as preparation so they do that to me i would say that happens about 10 times a year um but no i can speak to them anytime occasionally if i'm with somebody a message will come in but i also learned to train myself to stop that because when i started doing readings for a while i was just too open all the time so i'd go for coffee with people and I couldn't get my own mind back. It was, so I worked hard to go, okay, listen, I'm gonna do this as a job, but I need to leave the job at home. Otherwise, how, am I, how can I be a human being and have my own experiences and learning and relationships? So I'm pretty good at that boundary um, when I need it to be there, but, um, but it's very fluid, the connection. So everybody needs to get the book Conversation with Disease, book one, and Energy Speaks. You can get a lot more specific words from disease. And Lee also has a very exciting channeled mystery school on October 26. The best place for us to find that is at LeeHarrisEnergy.com, correct? And, yes. And we can also find you on iTunes, your music on iTunes by looking up Lee yeah, Harris. Yeah, our music's on Spotify. So I have a, a music website called Lee Harris Music. And the main website for all my work, where you'll also find links to the music, is LeeHarrisEnergy.com. So LeeHarrisMusic.com and LeeHarrisEnergy.com. And um, Initiation is the channeled mystery school. And uh, it will run for four weeks from October 26th. But it's if you can't make the live broadcast, everything is a replay for you. So you can take it at your own leisure and you have lifetime access. Fantastic. And please tell Disease thank you so much thank for you. everything that they're doing. And uh, I appreciate it. It means a lot. So uh, Lee Harris, everyone, uh, you can check out the links that I'll put in the description for the book and his website. Um, it's been just such an honor to meet you. And, and I'm wishing the very best in all the teachings in the future. And welcome to the reality revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that you're doing too. And it's lovely to meet you.
Thank you, Lee.